on world news tonight. Ban extended. Poland threatens to extend Ukrainian grain import ban after embargo date expires. Market engulfed. Massive fire rips through Bangladeshi market, leaving several dead and multiple injured. Fresh firings. Tensions escalate in the contentious Jammu Kashmir area following a gun battle. Royal Horror. Joseon Dynasty Royal Wedding Robes exhibited in Seoul to appreciate traditional royal wedding culture. This is Adha Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening, you are joining us on World News Tonight. We begin in a rattled Bangladesh as a huge fire destroyed several hundred shops at a market in Dhaka. According to the officials, there were no casualties in the fire, which was likely caused by an electric short circuit. And it has taken six hours for military forces and firefighters to contain the blaze, which spread quickly in the Mohammedpur market due to the large amount of flammable items such as cooking oil and plastics. Fires are common in densely populated Dhaka, which has seen a building boom in recent years, often without proper safety measures. Fires and explosions often occur due to faulty gas cylinders, air conditioners and bad electric wiring. Officials also state that 34 people, including 15 firefighters and rescue workers alongside the shop owners, fell sick as they inhaled black smoke while the rescue campaign was underway. No sight of easing tensions in the Kashmir front. Two officers of the Indian Army and a cop lost their lives following a gunfight with terrorists in Jammu and Kashmir. An Indian Army colonel, a major and a deputy superintendent of police have lost their lives following a gunfight that broke out between security forces and terrorists in Jammu and Kashmir. The encounter broke out between security forces and terrorists hiding in the Anantang district. An Army Rashtriya Rifles Unit commanding officer, a company commander and a Jammu and Kashmir police DSP were killed in action. The Army officers were leading the troops from the front after they had gone to search for terrorists in the area based on specific intelligence. Sources stated that the team of security personnel personnel were chasing terrorists in a hideout. As they climbed atop a building, terrorists hiding inside opened fire. The colonel died on the spot while the other two officials received gunshots. They were airlifted to a hospital in Srinagar where they succumbed to their injuries. Sources also said that the terrorists were from the resistance front, a proxy of Lakshkar. A Jammu and Kashmir police official also lost his life in the encounter. Police officials said that the bodies were retrieved amid heavy gunfire. Army helicopters were pressed on to service for evacuation during the fighting. There is no official word about the number of suspected rebels present in the gunfight. The encounter between security forces and terrorists is still underway. Residents of the devastated Libyan city of Derna desperately searched for missing relatives after a catastrophic flood that killed thousands of people and swept many out to sea. The death toll topped 6,000 with local authorities predicting that the figure could rise to a well over 10,000. Rescue workers in Libya on Wednesday kept up desperate searches for survivors after a powerful storm tore through the country, bursting dams and washing whole neighborhoods out to sea. The following images are graphic. Thousands have been confirmed dead, with many thousands more still missing. In the hard-hit eastern city of Derna, soldiers were seen recovering bodies from the sea. Scores more lay out in the streets, covered in blankets, as people search for missing relatives. Among those searching is Mustafa Salem. He said when the dam burst, his extended family were sleeping. No one was ready, he says. We lost 30 people so far, 30 members of the same family. We haven't found anyone. Humanitarian aid is starting to arrive. This shipment is from Qatar. It's desperately needed for the estimated tens of thousands that have been displaced. Eight convoys and trucks carrying bulldozers were spotted by Wednesday. But rescue operations are complicated by deep political fractures in the country. There's an internationally recognized government of national unity in the West and a parallel administration that operates in the East, including Derna. Speaking by phone, one official from the administration that runs Eastern Libya said the country did not have the experience to deal with the aftermath of such a disaster. 
will extend its ban on imports of grain from Ukraine unless the European Union allows its own restrictions to stay in place beyond Friday, a move that raises tensions with both Kyiv and Brussels. No incoming trucks in sight at this Polish-Ukrainian border crossing, just a Prime Minister vowing to keep grain imports out. We will defend the interests of Polish farmers, no matter what they say in Brussels, Berlin or Kyiv. Kyiv says Poland is violating international trade law. Yet Warsaw wants not only to extend the ban, but to expand it and include honey too. This beekeeper approves. Some farms risk closing down. We can't accept that. To help others, you have to first be in good condition yourself. That country can't ask us to slaughter ourselves for their sake. Unable to export via the Black Sea, last year Ukrainian companies started selling grain in Poland much cheaper. It forced prices down by around 30 percent, according to Wiesław Grin, who led farmers' protests earlier this year. This barn is filled almost to the roof with wheat that is today unneeded. With great difficulty, we sold just 10 percent of the harvest. The rest is here. Yet Grin says banning imports from Ukraine for another three months won't solve the problem. If we don't increase the capacity of our ports for our own production as well as for Ukrainian production, then we'll be stuck in this fratricidal struggle about who gets to load which ship. And that's not what it should be about because on the global level, there is no surplus of grain. Currently, Polish ports can barely handle the country's own exports, let alone Ukrainian produce. And rail freight capacity, Grin says, needs to at least double. Tonight's road to the White House now. Donald Trump remains the clear 2024 favorite among Republican grassroots leaders and in strong position to win his party's presidential nomination. But there's some evidence that the contest could become more competitive. That's according to the latest poll of GOP county chairs from across the country. Even as the former president continues to hold a real lead over his rivals, a large Republican contingent is undecided and remains open to other candidates. And this group is increasingly open to several other contenders, not just Ron DeSantis, but Tim Scott, Nikki Haley and Vivek Ramaswamy. The survey of GOP county chairs is part of an ongoing effort to track the so-called invisible primary for the 2024 Republic presidential nomination. The invisible primary comprises the crucial coordination and jockeying that occurs before anyone starts voting, but which will do much to determine the eventual winner. The most recent survey conducted throughout August, with responses coming in both before and after the first GOP debate, shows slight softening of Trump's support, but still with a substantial lead. As in June, roughly twice as many county party chairs are now committed to Trump than DeSantis, and no other candidates had the support of more than 4% of chairs. Yet, roughly half of local Republican leaders, even those who expect Trump to become their nominee, remain uncommitted. Though Trump has been ahead by massive margins in some polls of GOP voters, this survey suggests a key group of grassroots leaders has yet to fully embrace the former president. Welcome back. Sydney ciders in Australia are in for a shock as the petrol prices reached a record high this week. But the bad news doesn't stop there, as it's forecast to only get worse. It's enough to make you ditch the car and walk. Sky-high petrol prices now only going up. People will spend more tonight on petrol than they ever have before in Sydney. That is the sad reality that we face. The average price of regular unleaded hit an equal record high of $2.18 a litre across Sydney. The last time it reached that was in June last year. Why? Oil producing countries such as Saudi Arabia restricting supply. Refinery issues in Malaysia and Singapore, a much weaker Aussie dollar and now concern recent floods in Libya will hamper refining there. Fuel costs are highlighted in the latest CBA Household Spending Insights Index, which looks at where our money's going. Aside 
from petrol, education is up, driven by an influx of foreign students. We're also outlaying more on household goods, motor vehicles and health. Insurance was up too because of surging premiums. Overall, spending grew 2.3% for the year to August. This time last year, it was growing at 18.7%. The full effect of the interest rate rises are, are not yet in uh, most household budgets, and so there's some further tightening of financial conditions to come in coming months, and we think that'll slow spending further. The CBA index shows we splurged on the FIFA Women's World Cup and on tickets for blockbuster movies and concerts. Yes. For the first time in more than four years, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un sat down for talks with his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin. Kim vowed to help Russia in what he called a fight against imperialism, and Putin signaled Russia's willingness to help North Korea launch its rockets and satellites. The meeting that has been closely watched by observers in the West took place at a spaceport in the Russian Far East. As Kim arrived at a remote space launch site in Russia's Far East, the leaders of the two isolated states exchanged smiles and shook hands. Putin, who is usually late to meetings with other foreign leaders, arrived at the Postochny Cosmodrome early and waited for Kim for about 30 minutes. Since their meeting in 2019, the war in Ukraine has turned the tables, as it is Putin who is reaching out to Kim for help, with Russia completely isolated on the global stage, in need of help for more weapons. In his opening remarks, Putin thanked Kim for accepting Russia's invitation, saying they have a lot to discuss. Of course, we need to discuss the issues of economic cooperation and humanitarian issues, as well as the situation in the region. Sitting next to Putin, Kim said Russia is fighting a sacred war and stressed that his regime would fight together in the battle against imperialism. We have constantly expressed our full and unconditional support for all the decisions taken by the president and the Russian leadership. And I want to assure you that we will always be together with Russia in the fight against imperialism. The two leaders held talks for several hours with their ministers before holding a separate one-on-one -on -one meeting. This was followed by a lavish lunch where Kim said they held an elaborate discussion about the military and political situation on the Korean Peninsula and in Europe. On the situation in Ukraine, he assured Putin that Russia will win against evil. The Russian army and people will certainly secure a great victory in the sacred struggle for the punishment of a great evil that claims hegemony and feeds an expansionist illusion. The North Korean leader also expressed hopes that Wednesday's visit will play an important role in transforming their traditionally friendly relations into a, quote, unbreakable strategic partnership. Meanwhile, Russia has also signaled its willingness to assist Pyongyang. When asked by a reporter whether Russia would help North Korea launch its own satellites and rockets, Putin responded by saying, that's exactly why we're here. He added that Kim showed great interest in rocket engineering. Before sitting down for talks, Putin showed Kim around the building, where Russia's new space booster, the Angara, is assembled. The fact that the two leaders chose the specific spaceport for the meeting suggests that North Korea and Russia will enhance security cooperation, as it is a symbol of Russia's ambitions as a space power. From Pyongyang, Kim took a long train journey aboard his private armored train to get there. Putin may offer satellite launch technology to Kim in exchange for North Korean weapons and ammunition. This has been sparking concerns regarding Russia's resupplying of weapons for the war in Ukraine and the development of North Korea's missile capabilities. Apple defended its iPhone 12 model after a French watchdog ordered a halt to its sales citing breaches of European Union radiation exposure limits. Apple on Wednesday defended its iPhone 12 model after a French watchdog ordered a halt to its sales citing breaches of European Union radiation exposure limits. The move increased the possibility of other bans across Europe. France's National Frequency Agency said it would send agents to Apple stores and other distributors to make sure the model was no longer being sold, adding that a failure to act would result in the recall of iPhone 12s already sold to consumers. Apple, meanwhile, disputed the watchdog's findings, saying in a statement that the iPhone 12 launched in 2020, was certified by multiple international bodies as compliant with global radiation standards, that it had provided several Apple and third-party lab results proving the phone's compliance to the French agency, 
in that it was contesting its findings. One man who spoke said that he felt safe using an iPhone, adding that he's owned one since his younger years and never had any problem. This health worker told that, quote, we've learned not to go too fast with these kind of scandals, so we need to take time to really look at what the issue is, and then, yes, they'll have to take action. Industry experts said there were no safety risks, and a French government source said the agency's test was different from the method used by Apple. In other related news, the junta in Niger said it would end a military pact with neighboring Benin, accusing it of authorizing the deployment of troops on its territory for a possible military intervention against Niger. Niger's junta on Tuesday said it would end a military pact with neighboring Benin. The junta accuses it of authorizing the deployment of troops on its territory for a possible military intervention against Niger by the West African regional bloc ECOWAS. In a statement read on national television, the junta said Benin had decided to consider aggression against Niger instead of supporting it. The Republic of Benin has authorized the stationing of military personnel, mercenaries and war material with a view to an aggression against our country by France in collaboration with certain ECOWAS countries. As a result, the new Nigerian authorities decided to renounce the military cooperation agreement with Benin, the statement said. There was no immediate response from Benin. ECOWAS is trying to negotiate with the leaders of the July 26 Niger coup, but it has said that it's ready to use force if diplomatic efforts fail. The bloc has not shared any details about possible deployments, and Niger last week said talks with the bloc continued. Welcome back. For more news, let's take it on the world in a minute. At least six Indonesian provinces in Sumatra and Borneo were battling forest fires. Indonesian authorities dumped large amounts of water to battle forest fires in the South Sumatra province as haze clouds covered nearby cities. Lake Prespa, one of Europe's oldest lakes and home to more than 2,000 species of fish, birds, mammals and plants, is rapidly receding, adding to many worries of locals. Billionaire and founder of major Apple supply Foxconn Terry Goh announces actress Tammy Lai, who starred in the hit Netflix drama as his running mate in Taiwan's presidential election next year. Lai played a presidential candidate who wins the election in the hit Taiwanese Netflix show wave makers. Asylum seekers in the Mexican border towns of Tijuana and Ciudad Juarez gathered near the border wall hoping to enter the United States to ask for asylum. Seekers reported to camping or waiting next to the border hoping the border patrol will capture them and process them in the US. Five-month-old baby boy drowned after a migrant boat capsized off the Italian island of Lampedusa. Following the incident, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres called for the solidarity among the European Union on the issue of migration. That is all we have for you on World News tonight. If you miss any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Atadarina English. We're leaving you tonight in Seoul as a special exhibition showcasing the beauty of Huarot is set to take visitors on a journey through the world of the royal bridal gown from the Joseon dynasty. Thank you for watching. Good night.